Today, I'm going to be reading the fifth part of Chapter 5 of Hiroshima by John Hersey. Dr. Masaraksu Fuji. A confinal man, 50 years old, Dr. Fuji enjoyed the company of foreigners and his practice in the Kahachi Clinic. Rolled, along com rolled comfortably along. It was his pleasure in the evenings to ply members of the compilating forces with the seemingly endless support of sutinary whiskey that he somehow laid hands on. For years, he had a hobby of studying foreign languages, English among them. Father Kleinsorg had, been a lo had long been a friend, and he, visit he used to visit in the evenings to teach Dr. Fuji to speak German. The doctor had also taken up Esperanto. During the war, the Japanese secret police had got it in their in, in into their heads that the Russians used Esperanto too for their spying codes, and Doctor Fuji had more than once had been questioned clo had been been questioned closely about whether he was not getting messages from Connemadern. He was now eager to make friends with Americans. In 1948, he built a new clinic in Hiroshima on the, on the site of one that had been ruined by the bomb. The new one was a modest wooden building with half a dozen bedrooms for inpatients. He trained as an orthopedic surgeon, but after the war, that craft was becoming subdivided into various specialties. He had earlier had as inner, in, special interest in parental hip dislocations, but he now thought himself too old to go very far with that or any other specialty. Besides, he lacked the sophisticated equipment needed for the special, special occasion, specialization. He performed op operations on keloids, did appendictoriums, and treated wounds. He also took medical and occasionally venereal cases. Through his occupations, friends, he was able to get up to get penicillin. He treated about 80 patients a day. He had five grown children, and in the Japanese tradition, they followed in their father's footsteps. The oldest and youngest were daughters, Mayo and Kayo, and both married doctors. The oldest son, Matsutoshi, a doctor, inherited the Kachukichu Clinic and its practice. The second son, Kiju, did not go to medical school but became an x-ray technician. And the third son, Sigjuku, was... Uh, a young doctor on the staff of Neo John University Hospital in Tokyo. Keio lived with his parents in the house of, that Dr. Fuji had built next to Hiroshima Clinic. Dr. Fuji suffered from none of the effects of radiation overdose, and he evidently felt that for any psychological damage the horrors of the bombing may have done him the best therapy was to follow the pressure principle. Indeed, he recommended to the Habusakin who did have radiation symptoms, that they take a regular dosage of alcohol. He enjoyed himself. He was com compassionate towards his patients, but he did not believe in working too hard. He had a dance floor installed in his house, and he bought a billiard table. He enjoyed photography and built himself a dark room. He played mahjong. He loved having foreign house guests. At bedtime, his nurses gave him massages and sometimes therapeutic injections. He took up golf and built a sand bunker and set up driving net in his garden. In 1955, he paid the entrance fee of 150,000 yen, then a little more than $400, to join the exclusive Hiroshima Country Club. <clears throat> he did not play much golf, but to the eventual great joy of his children, he kept the family membership. Thirty years later, it would cost him 15 million yen or $60,000 to join the club. He said come to the Japanese baseball mania. The Hiroshima players were at first called in English the Carps until he pointed out to those the public that the plural for the that fish and those ball players had no s. He went often to watch games at a huge and at the huge new stadium not far from the A bomb dome, the ruins of the Hiroshima in industrial prom promotion hall, which the city had kept as its only direct physical reminder of the bomb. In their early seasons, the carp had dismissal records, yet had a financial following, something like those of the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Mets in their lean years. But Dr. Fuji 
rather mischievously rooted for the Tokyo Swallows, he wore a swallow's button on the label of his jacket. Hiroshima and its regeneration as a brand new city after the bombing turned up with one of the godliest entertainment districts in all of Japan, an area where at night vast neon signs of colored many colors winkled and beckoned to the potential customers of bars, geisha houses, coffee shops, dance halls, and licensed houses of prostitution. One night, Dr. Fuji, who had begun to have a reputation as a pura, or playboy, took his tenderfoot son, Seiji Yuki, who was 20 years old, and home a while from the grind of his Tokyo medical school, out on the town to show him how to be a man. They went to a, a building where there was a huge dance floor with girls lined up along one side. Toshio told his father he didn't know what to do. His legs felt weak. His legs felt weak. Dr. Fuji bought a ticket, picked out an especially beautiful girl, and told Sajuki to bow to her and take her out there and do the step that he had taught him on the dance floor at home. He told the girl to be gentle with his son, and he drifted away. In 1956, Dr. Fuji had an adventure. At the time, the so-called Hiroshima maidens had gone to the United States for plastic surgery. The year before, they were accompanied by two Hiroshima, Hiroshima surgeons. Those two could not stay away for more than a year, and Dr. Fuji was selected to take the place of one of them. He left in February, and for 10 months in and around New York, he, he played the part of a warm and caring father to, to, 25 handicapped, to, to 25 handicapped daughters. He observed their observations at Mount Sinai Hospital and acted as interpreter for the American doctors and the, and the girls, helping the latter to understand what was happening to them. It pleased them to be able to think to be able to speak German with the Jewish wives of some of the doctors. And at one and at one reception, no less a person than the governor of New York State complimented them on his English. Compliment, complimented him on his English. The girls staying with American host families who spoke little or no Japanese were often lonely, and Dr. Fuji devised ways to cheer them up. <clears throat> he was playful and considerate. He organized outings for Japanese food, taking two or three girls at a time. Once a party was to be given by an American doctor and his wife, just three days after one of the maidens, Maicho Yakamoa, had undergone a major operation. Her face had dressing on it, and her hands were bandaged and strapped to her body. Dr. Fuji didn't want to miss her party, didn't want to miss the party, and he got one of the American doctors to arrange for her ride through the city to the party in an open red limousine. Behind the police escort with a siren, on the way, Dr. Fuji had them stop at a drugstore where he bought Michiko a toy horse for 10 cents. He asked the policeman to take a picture of the presentation of this gift. Sometimes he went out alone to have a good time. The other Japanese doctor named Takahashi was his hotel roommate. Dr. Takahashi was a light drinker and a little sleepier. Late that night, Dr. Fuji would come in, crash around, flop down, and break into sleep-shattering symphony of snores. He was having a wonderful time. Was he nine, ten years later in Hiroshima, still so happy, hap, happy-go-lucky? His daughter Chio's husband, not though thought not. The son-in-law thought he saw signs of a growing stubbornness and rigidity in him and a turn toward melancholy so that Dr. Fuji could ease up his work, ease up his work, his third son. Shingu gave up his practice in Tokyo and, be, and came to be his assistant, moving into a house that his father had built on a plot of the ground around a block from the clinic. One cloud in father's life was a quarrel in the Hiroshima Lions Club, of which he was president. The fight was over whether the club should try, through its admissions policy, to be exclusive 
high society organization like some some of the japanese doctors associations or remain essentially a, a service organization open to all when it appeared that dr fuji might lose out in his fight for the latter view he abrupt and disappointed disappointingly resigned his relationship with his wife was growing difficult every ever since his trip to america he had wanted a house like the one of Mount Sinai doctors, and now to her chagrin, he designed and built next to the wooden house Shikuya was living in, a three-story concrete home for himself alone. <clears throat> On the ground floor, it had a living room and an American-style kitchen. His study was on the second floor, lined with bound books, which... Shanghai eventually found to be the volume after volume of melancholy Medicalius copies he made in middle school of course notes by a classmate named Iwano Iwan Imoto who was brighter than he and on the top floor were eight mat Japanese style bedroom and an American style bathroom towards the end of 1963 he rushed its comp completion so it would be ready completion so it would be ready to house an American couple who had been host parents for some bathings and were com to, and com coming to visit after the nights of the year. He wanted to sleep there for the first for a few nights to try it out. His wife argued against the haste, but he stubbornly moved in. Late in December, New Year's Eve, nineteen sixty-three, Doctor Fuji sat cozily on the tamamai matting of Sheng Ju's living room with his legs in Costo, an electrically heated foot warming recess in the floor. Also gathered were Shang Ju and his wife and another couple, but not Dr. Fuji's wife. The plan was to have some drinks and watch the annual New Year's Eve television program called Ko Haku. Uni Utah Gassin, a contest between red female and white male teams of popular singers who had been chosen for the program by a poll of listeners. Judges were famous actresses, golf authors, golfers, baseball players, and baseball players. The program would run from 9 to 11.45, and then there would be a bell ringing for New, Year's, for New Year. At about 11, Shang Ju noticed that his father, who had not been drinking much, was nodding and suggested that he go off to bed. And in a few minutes before the end of the program, he did, this time without the administrations of a nurse who most nights massaged his legs and tucked him in. After a while, worrying about his father, Shang Ju went out and around to the river side of the new house where, looking up, he saw a light burning in the bedroom window. He thought all was well. The family had made a plan to meet the next morning at 11 for drinks in the traditional New Year's breakfast of Uzami, a soup and mochi rice cakes. Jakeo and her husband and some of the other guests arrived and began drinking. At half past 11, Dr. Fuji had not appeared and Sang Sing Yu sent his seven-year-old son, Magugasku, out to call up up to his window. The boy, getting no answer, tried the door. It was locked. He borrowed a ladder from the neighbor's house and climbed to the top of it to call some more. And still, there was no response. When he told his parents, they became alarmed and hurried. Broke out a window next. Broke out a window next to the locked door and got it open. And smelling gas, rushed upstairs. They found Doctor Fuji unconscious with a gas heater on the head of his foot and turned on, but not burning. Strangely, a ventilator fan was also turned on. The draft of fresh air from it probably kept him alive. He was stretched out uh, on his back, looking serene. <clears throat> there were three doctors present, son, son-in-law, and a guest, and fetching ox oxygen and other equipment from the clinic, they did everything they could to revive Dr. Fuji. They called in. Well, they called in one of the best doctors they knew, Professor Manglishi, <clears throat> from Hiroshima University. His first question was: "This a suicide attempt?" The family thought not. There was nothing to be done until January fourth. <clears throat> Everything in Hiroshima would be shut down tight for three day year, for three day New Year's holiday, 
and hospital service would be at a minimal. Dr. Fuji remained unconscious, but his life signs seemed not to be critical. On the 4th, an ambulance came. As the, as the bearers were carrying Dr. Fuji downstairs, he stirred. Swimming up in his toward consciousness, he apparently thought he was being rescued somehow after an atomic bombing. Who are you? he asked. Are you soldiers? In the university hospital, he began to recover. On January 15th, when the annual sumo wrestling contest began, he asked for a portable television set he had bought in America, and he set it up in bed watching. He could feed himself, and though his handling of chopsticks was a bit awkward, he asked for a bottle of sake. By now, everyone in the family was off guard. On January 25th, his stool was suddenly watery and bloody, and he became dehydrated and lost consciousness. For the next 11 years, he lived the life of a, of a vegetable. <laughs> he remained in the hospital, fed through a tube for two and a half years, then was taken home, where his wife and a loyal servant cared for him, feeding him through a tube, changing his diapers, bathing him, massaging him, medicating him for urinary infections he developed. At times, he seemed to respond to voices, and sometimes he seemed to be dimly registered for pleasure or displeasure. At 10 o'clock on the night of January 11, 1973, Shangju took his son, Magugusu, and the boy who had climbed the ladder to call his grandfather on the day of the accident, now a pre-medical student of 16, to Dr. Fuji's bedside. He wanted the boy to see his grandfather with the eye of a doctor. Megasu listened to his grandfather's breathing and heartbeat and took his blood pressure. He judged his condition was condition stable and Shingui agreed. The next morning, Shingui's mother telephoned him, saying that his father looked funny to her. When Shangju arrived, Dr. Fuji was dead. The, doc the doctor's widow was against having the autopsy done. Shingu wanted one, and he resorted to a ruse. He had the body taken to a crematorium, and then that night it was taken out back way and delivered to the American-run atomic bomb called to the Compassion on the top of the hill to the east of the city. When the post-mortem had been done, Chengju went for the report, finding his father's organs distributed among various containers. He had the strangest feeling of the last encounter, and he said, There you are, Atu Chin. There you are, Papa. He said that his father's brain had atrophified and his larger intestine, intestine had become enlarged, and there was the cancer the size of a ping pong ball in his liver. The remains were cremated and buried in the grounds of the night at Lotus Temple in Jugen Shinshu, sect of Buddhism, Buddhism near the maternal family home in Nagasaki. Then came a sad ending to the Habasakan story. His family quarreled over his property, and a mother sued a son. Thank you for watching. That's all for today.